45 minutes from now, and I'll take a break, <laughs> coffee break. Um, the title of the talk here, um, uh, as Howard says, uh, is a reflection of work that I've done before, and it's a little bit of a joke on me, uh, because I have, in fact, uh, talked about time so many times, um, and, and it starts to be difficult um, not to keep saying the same thing. Um, one early publication was called ESL, Time to Teach, um, and the point of that publication was that um, in the province of Quebec, where I was working at that time, uh, students were studying English for uh, sometimes two hours a week, sometimes less, um, and at the end of many years of studying English, people wondered why they weren't more proficient in the language. Um, so I suggested that maybe one of the issues might indeed be time to teach. Um, I'm not the only person, and in fact I suspect that every single teacher in the world knows that time is very important. John Carroll is usually credited with having talked about how learning time is positively correlated with learning success, both in general education and in language learning in particular. He even came up with a mathematical formula, which is fun to play with, that the degree of learning is equal to the time spent learning divided by the time needed to learn. And of course, you can't really divide words by words, but you get the point that, that the amount of time needed to learn is usually quite a lot larger than the amount of time that's actually available. Of course, Carol always, always cautioned that time as such is not what counts, uh, but it's what happens during that time. So in this evening's uh, discussion, I want to run through and focus on five questions. I want to talk about the fundamental question of how much time you actually need to learn a language, how much time is usually available in different contexts for learning a language, how to increase learning time, what is the time that actually matters, if you increase it then what do you do with it, and then how do we make the best use of the time that we actually have. So how much time is needed to learn a language? We know that for children learning the language or languages spoken in their homes, by the time they get to school, they will have been exposed to thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. So the next time somebody tells you that for children, language learning is just, you know, easy and they really do it quickly, count the hours that they actually spend engaging with the language, whether it's their single first language or multiple languages spoken at home, they spend a lot of time. If they take that same language and go to school, and, and the school uses that language as well, they'll add another 13 to 17,000 hours of school language time by the time they finish their, um, their primary secondary education. So we don't measure language learning time in, in minutes and hours, but rather in years and months of, of time. So how much time is needed? A lot more than most people think. We still have to cope with the um, phenomenon of government policy that thinks that children can come to school with no knowledge of English and at the end of a six months or a year be ready to be fully mainstreamed into uh, age-appropriate classes with other students who have, who have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours acquiring that language at home. We know that we need thousands of hours, not hundreds of hours, and we know that most learners need far more language, far more exposure, far more hours than they could ever possibly get in a classroom. How much time is actually available in the classroom? Um, this um, graph struck me as amusing because already we've talked about how relatively little time is available for the language classroom, but in fact, um, it's, it's interesting to consider how much of an adolescent's life is even spent in the classroom. We think about kids, they go to school, that's what they do. But in fact, if you look at all of their, look at their whole life, um, a great deal of their time is spent doing other things besides being in school, 
They do have to sleep, although not nearly as much as I ought to. Um, but only about 14% of their waking, uh, or sorry, of their 24-hour of their clock day is spent um, in school. Now, that says to you that if, if that's all they get for schooling, then somehow or other you've got to expand the learning time outside the classroom. And of course, if we look at the 24 hours of an adult life, and I just made this one up because, of course, I didn't have the research to base it on, but imagine if you maybe get seven hours of sleep, and it takes you two hours back and forth to commute to your job. You have a job that you have to work at for eight hours a day, and then you have family responsibilities and the groceries and the kids' homework, and you have to go pick them up at school, and that takes from your, that gives you maybe an hour in that day to learn English, for example, or to uh, do any other thing related to English learning. So we look at how much time people actually have for language learning in a classroom setting, and it gets very small. So in, when we think about classroom learning, um, if students actually get an hour a day, or um, which isn't necessary, in, in school an hour a day, that would be 180 to 200 hours a year. If instead of doing regular foreign language or second language classes, they do um, something like CLIL, where they are studying not only the language, but also a subject in the language, that might double their time. Now I'm talking about students learning a, a, another language in a, in a, a language other than English situation. Um, or students who are in immersion classes might get three to five hours a day, and that would add them up to several hundred hours a year. But you see the contrast between these numbers and the numbers uh, of, of language, uh, numbers of hours that are available and used for language learning outside of school. So language learning takes thousands of hours. Classroom time is scarce and precious. So how can we increase that time, and how should we use the time that we have? The, I think this is always the way I begin and end um, my classes on language acquisition with um, prospective teachers. And that is to tell them that what they do in the classroom is, is purely for the purpose of preparing students to keep learning outside the classroom. What happens inside the classroom has to be used for that purpose. Because so little time is available in the classroom, every single minute that you spend in the classroom needs to prepare you to get out and keep learning outside the classroom. One of the ways that we've tried to add time is to shift from teaching language to teaching through language. So, for example, using content-based approaches to instruction to teach and learn a new language at the same time you're learning something interesting and appropriate. In other words, instead of learning language so that someday you can use it in a context for learning something interesting and appropriate, you do both at the same time. You learn something interesting and age appropriate, and you learn something, uh, you learn the language at the same time. And I keep, I insist on that expression age appropriate because I think for a lot of adult learners, the experience of what goes on in the classroom doesn't always feel age appropriate. A lot of adult learners, I think, feel that they're being sort of um, made to feel younger than they, than they feel. They, they're made to feel that, um, first of all, as, as we all know, all of us who have, who have learned to speak another language, as you are learning to speak another language, you feel diminished, you feel smaller than you really are because you can't say all the things that you want to be able to say. So it's doubly important in the classroom for students not to be made to feel that they are marking time doing trivial things um, as they are preparing someday to be able to use the language effectively. Instead, to the greatest extent possible, that which happens inside the classroom should be age appropriate and, and compelling and interesting in itself as the language is being learned. Um, approaches such as immersion and content and language integrated uh, learning, sheltered content instruction and other versions of content-based instruction have improved learning outcomes where they've been made available. There's no question that, um, well, we used to say that immersion, French immersion in Canada, is um, 
the most successful implementation of a foreign language, I put quotes all around foreign language for the moment, uh, teaching program that anybody ever attempted um, until French immersion was implemented in Canada. And English-speaking Canadian children spent 10 or 12 years studying French a couple of hours a day and ended their education unable to speak French, as they used to say, unable to order breakfast in Quebec uh, when they went on a tourist visit. French immersion has changed that. French immersion hasn't made French speakers out of English-speaking Canadians, but it has made the biggest difference in their ability to use the language outside of school. So uh, content-based approaches have made a big difference. CLIL approaches, which are usually implemented in secondary schools, and I know that, that Victoria has, adopt, has embraced um, CLIL in some of its language programs for uh, secondary school students as well. Um, these programs give students um, richer experiences with the language and allow them to develop more advanced language ability than they would, would, te would usually develop in a purely language-focused um, class. Um, one of the recommendations that inevitably comes up when we talk about getting more time is to limit the use of the first language in a second language classroom. Now, um, I, I know that having chatted with a number of you, I, I know I'm talking to the, the, I think the absolute complete range of the types of uh, classroom experiences that are possible. I've talked to people who are teaching primary school. I've talked to people who are teaching adult learners. Most of you, of course, this is Vic TESOL, after all, are teaching English instead of another language. Um, but I think um, you'll be familiar with this phenomenon. It isn't just in the French as a foreign language classroom that people try to remove the influence of the, of the, first line, of the student's first language. It's also um, in TESOL settings, where it's assumed that the best way to learn English is to speak only English and to think in English right from the very first day you walk in the door. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that in, in several ways. Um, first place, if you are a human being, um, you cannot shut off one of your languages while you're speaking another one. Your languages are always there. They're always present. And the good news, they always support each other. So the idea that you can, you can or should get rid of the first language comes out of this idea of competing languages, too. That if you learn more of English, then you, you, in order to learn more of English, you have to learn less of something else. You have to squish out that old language so you can fill up your head with the new language. This wonderful illustration from an old book by Jim Cummins uh, shows what that is, 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 what that is intended to convey. But the research, of course, doesn't support that at all. The research says that adding a new language, adding a second language, actually not only is good in itself, but it also enhances the knowledge of the, can enhance the knowledge of the first language um, uh, as, as, as you develop. And the development, the continuing growth of a first language in other words, instead of saying, stop speaking that language, and saying instead, go home and ask your mom how to say that in Arabic. Go home and discuss with your mom how to say that in Spanish. Come back tomorrow and give me, a, give me the, uh, this list of words uh, in the language that you speak with your family at home. Or look, ask your mom to tell you a story, and tomorrow I'm going to ask you to tell me what she told you. In other words, making the connections with the child's first language um, can contribute positively to the child's second language development, not just for reasons of identity and, and self-confidence, but also because language is language. And it, it, it's not too, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not learn more of this, you have to have less of that. On the contrary, both languages contribute to a common underlying language proficiency. And again, another, that, that, another illustration from that old book, uh, showing that the languages all feed into this common underlying proficiency. Um, Ellen Bialystok is famous for talking about language bilingualism as a lifetime benefit. The, long, the longer you continue to use multiple languages in your life, the greater the benefits. Um, and these benefits extend all the way to 
the delay of the onset of dementia, um, but also, of course, the, the, just the, the, the practical benefits of knowing more than one language. Um, we, I, I, was a, I grew up in a part of the U.S. where only English was spoken. In fact, some people would argue about that and question whether that was English. But I, I can tell you I always like to remember that my father said when Jimmy Carter was elected that they finally had somebody who knew how to speak English properly. <laughs> now, that, if you laugh at that, you understand that that's the English I grew up speaking. Um, I didn't get to be president. Although I think I might have done just about as well as some people we won't mention. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, speaking, um, speaking more than one language throughout your life uh, is a benefit that, that not only is a practical one, if I, had, if I had never learned another language, I would still be, probably, living in that part of the world where I grew up. But instead, language took me well, it brought me to Australia, for one thing, because I was just, as, I, as I studied language and language learning, it started with my own uh, learning of other languages. So it's a practical benefit, but it's also a benefit that just happens right here between your ears. It actually is good for your brain. Um, and to tell people that they should put aside the language that they've already learned as in order to learn another language is simply to not understand human cognition, human, human brain, is very well equipped to handle multiple languages and benefits from doing so. Um, it's important, as Jim Cummins has often reminded us, that, that you, you get those benefits if you acquire the languages up to a certain level. It, it's, not, it's not enough to just know uh, the, tourist, uh, the 10 tourist sentences. Uh, you have to actually study and work with the language and, and reach a level of proficiency that, that allows you to integrate your languages, but it is, it is to your benefit if you do so. Um, and of course, Lily Long Fillmore, years ago, was one of the first people to, to demonstrate, to, to, to publish a discussion of the human cost of losing a language and what this can do to families, what it can do to social groups, um, and what the cost can be in cognitive terms as well. And lots of people have talked about it since then, but this was something that was um, presented many years ago. So second language learning can build on first language knowledge, especially through literacy. Um, so another, another question then is, uh, what's the best time to start learning another language? If we're saying that it's good to build on the language you already have, um, should you start teaching a second language as early as possible? Um, is, that the, is that the way to approach it? Or should you wait until a child has reached a certain level and has already acquired literacy in one language and therefore can start to use that kind of knowledge to learn another language? Um, or is it, uh, okay, we'll just, uh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, so should we start as early as possible? That's, of course, that, that if there is a universal belief, it probably is the fact that it is that younger learners are better learners. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I have to bite my tongue in conversation with strangers. You know those conversations you have on an airplane where people say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I study language learning, language teaching. And they say, oh, children are such wonderful language learners. Isn't it, isn't it it's so important to start as early as possible? And I always just, <laughs> I just smile. Um, because, in fact, younger learners are not necessarily better learners. They're different learners. So a younger learner uses the ability to acquire languages, we call it implicitly. In other words, they, they don't even know they're doing it, but they're doing it all the time. But in order to do it successfully, they have to have massive, massive amounts of language exposure. So with massive input and implicit learning, their progress is actually slower than the progress of an older learner contrary to all the things people say. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, if you start young and get massive amounts of input and keep at it, then you may reach the highest levels of proficiency so that you may someday be one of those people that people turn to and say, well, when did you start learning English? I didn't know you even spoke another language. Because if, over time, if you start young and you keep it up, you can reach the highest levels. On the other hand, older learners, 
can also take advantage of their ability to learn explicitly and intentionally. So they can learn implicitly as well. They can learn while they're paying attention to something else. But they have the benefit, in addition, of being much better than children at saying, I need to learn this, and I'm going to learn it between now and tomorrow afternoon. They can do that on purpose in ways that children cannot, so that even with somewhat less rich input, they are able to learn faster, and they can reach levels of communicative competence and communicative confidence that allows them to do just about anything with the language. Um, and and what, what is troubling, of course, sometimes is how people feel inadequate because they have a level of language that isn't perfect, but in fact, they can do everything with the language that they want to do. Uh, it's just that they maybe sound a little bit different or have to spend a little more time looking for a word or take them a little bit longer to read something. But they have the, the tools that they can use um, it to, to use the language as a valuable tool. So younger learners are not better learners. Um, they're just different learners. And they're certainly not faster learners. That, 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 there's just simply no discussion about that. So when you are learning a second language at school, um, the quality of input and instruction are much more important than the age at which you begin. So it, 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 whenever, uh, whenever I, my, my own experience, uh, most of my research for 25 years was in the province of Quebec. Very interesting and complicated kind of place, just like every other place in the world, actually, kind of thing. But I always say that, but as soon as I say it, I think that's ridiculous. Every place in the world is crazy and complicated. <laughs> However, just to, this, the particular crazy complications in Quebec were that this was, a, when I got there, we were just in the process of, or we, the, the, I arrived in Quebec in, 19, in the 1970s, just before a separatist government was elected that said, we are now going to do everything we can to protect French. And one of the things we're going to do to protect French is to make sure that all children, if they're migrants or, um, or French speaking at home, that they must go to, to uh, French language schools. The only exception will be and again, the law switched around a little bit, but the main, the final version of the law was the exception is English speaking Canadians can go to English schools. But everybody else in Quebec has to go to French school. So, um, in that context, uh, it, it was impossible to, to, for parents to do, for, for middle class educated parents to do what they used to do, which was to say, um, I want my child to learn English, so what I'm going to do is for a couple of years I'll just send him to an English school and then I'll take him back to go to secondary school in French. That was now illegal, so they couldn't do that. So they said, well, that's okay, there's French immersion. I've seen French immersion, so we'll just have English immersion. And the Quebec government said, no, you won't. There will, there will be no teaching of any subject matter except English in English. You can teach English in English. But you can't teach anything else in English. So that meant that kids were going to school in French schools, and they got a couple of hours of English a week, and that's all they got. And the parents, a lot of parents, were not terribly happy about that. So parents and teachers in some school areas said, what's our, what's our workaround? What's our loophole here? So what they did was to come up with a plan of teaching English intensively for one semester, one, one half a year. And so for six, five months, students would learn only English, and they would do all sorts of activities in English for four or five hours a day. And then at the end of those five months, they would go back into the regular program where they would get you know, an hour or two of English a week. But then because this, this, um, because this innovation had been so successful, secondary schools were also obliged to develop programs that would receive these children coming from the intensive English classes. So you see this impact of, of a grassroots movement forcing the Ministry of Education to do something wonderful. And the Ministry of Education kept on saying, you know, it's so good, we're going to make it universal. And then every time they would get this close to making it universal, then they would have an election, and some other group would come in and say, no, after all, we won't make it universal, but we'll encourage it. But what, what eventually has happened, and, and what's most frustrating, 
is that we get these letters, we literally get letters from the ministers of education saying, the research you're doing in intensive English is so interesting and so valuable, and we just think it's so good, and now we're going to start teaching English in grade one and give them an hour a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, and why do they do that? Why do they do that? Because no matter what you show, no matter what research you reveal, they will say, younger is better, Every parent knows that as soon, the sooner you start learning English, the better it's going to be. So we have fought that battle over and over again. Um, and right now, English begins earlier. Uh, but as the, um, the, one of the presidents of the Speak Association, which is the equivalent of your big TESOL association, said, yeah, they get three more years, but not another minute. <laughs> and that's pretty much the way it is right now. But some students get to do intensive, and that's great. But most students start in grade one and get an hour or two a week. And at the end of five or six or seven years, you know, I just feel like going around and around on the hamster wheel. And, but one of the things that, that, one of the truths is that older students do, older students, I, should, should, I didn't make it clear for those of you who have no idea what I'm really talking about, the intensive classes were for students when they had to be 10 or 11 or 12 years old. They weren't started in grade one, they were started for older students. So those students were already at a stage in their knowledge of French where they could build on the French to, to develop their English. So they had the skills and knowledge that they could build on. So what is the time, what is the learning time that matters? Well, the time that matters is the time that you actually spend using the language, not the time that's on the schedule, on the timetable, not the allocated time, the number of hours on the classroom schedule, not even the time on task that the teacher says, okay, that's what we're going to do for the next hour, but the time that learners are actually actively engaged with the language. Think about it. How much language do students actually hear or read or understand in a class hour? How many times do students produce meaningful language in a class hour? And the answer to that question, I'm sure, is as varied as there are people in this room, at least that varied. Um, but the reality is that when you have a room full of students, each individual student may have very limited opportunities to repeat something, that's, that, to repeat and, and to measure him or herself against what has just been heard. Um, how many opportunities to create something new, to say something new, how many opportunities to negotiate meaning in an interaction? How many, how many times does each individual student get to do that in the class hour? And how much individual feedback do students get in a class hour? Those questions you will see are left suspended, but I'll come back to say something more about how, to, how we can make the best use by, in, in partly in responding to those questions. Um, so I... In answer to my question about how we can make the best use of time, I have been very, my, I have myself been very inspired by Paul Nation's four strands for language teaching. Now, since I'm talking to a TESOL group, I'm thinking that most of you will know, certainly know Paul Nation's name, right? <laughs> mostly, yeah. <laughs> mostly, yeah. How many of you know the four strands? That's one, two, okie dokie, <laughs> okay. three, okay, you're, you're all being shy because you're afraid I'll ask you something about what I find. <laughs> but whether you raise your hand or not, I might ask you something, so don't, uh, don't think you're going to hide behind the fact that you didn't raise your hand. So um, again, I, I always, I said this when I was speaking at La Trobe the other day, um, whenever you say Paul Nation, it's like a, a word association test. If I say Paul Nation, what do you say? <laughs> of course, vocabulary, of course, you all know that. Okay, but, but Paul Nation isn't only about vocabulary, although his work has been overwhelmingly about vocabulary. But he um, proposed in a paper mm, about 10 years ago a very uh, clear outline of what it takes to put together instruction in a second language. And when you see what it is, if you don't already know, and I hope that most of you don't already know, 
Um, although, that's not true. I wish all of you knew. And after today, you will know. Um, but I hope that you'll be inspired to go and look further into these ideas. Um, he suggests that there, there really are only four things that you need to successfully teach a language. There are four things you need in a period of instruction. And I always think of that as it could be an hour, it could be a semester, it could be your, your whole curriculum over a period of, of years. But if you, need, you need these four things. First, you need to provide meaning-focused input. And this is pretty much what it sounds like. You need to have students in situations where they can understand what's being said or what they're reading but also where what they're reading or what they're hearing contains some new information or new words or new phrases or new ways of doing things. It sounds a lot like Krashen's comprehensible input with I plus one, for those of you who are old enough to know what that means, right? It's pretty much that. It's comprehensible input that's a little bit pushing. You know most of the words, you know most, you understand what you're reading, you really get the message. And certainly this character is characteristic of a lot of what goes on in immersion classes and clinical classes. You understand what's going on, and there's some, there's some words or some phrases you don't understand, so you have to work a little bit harder to get the, 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 the meaning. But you can learn from meaning-focused input. So that's the first thing you need. And, and I'm pretty convinced that that's where language learning begins. For, for most people, it's when you realize that you understand something and you can connect what you hear with something that's real in the world. So, of course, as, was, as, as everybody understood long time ago, you also need meaning-focused output. It is not enough. It is not enough to understand. You have to also produce language for various reasons, not just produce language after you've learned it, but you produce it in order to learn it. When you try to say something or write something, you realize what you don't know. So producing language is essential as a part of language, as, a, as the second of the four strands. So this is really meaningful, and, and I can't insist enough on that. Whether you're sitting at the computer um, reading something online, playing a game. Um, um, if, you, if the language is coming to you and you're understanding it, this is comprehensible input. If you're reading a story, if you're talking with your friends, you're getting comprehensible uh, input and producing comprehensible output. I'm sorry, the little typist there is, is actually producing language. I said he was listening, but he's, he's typing. And the one who's on the floor there, she's writing. She's writing in her diary. She's writing comprehensible, meaning-focused output. Um, so the Meaning focused input, meaning focused output. What's next? Don't you dare say. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm supposed to think like a teacher. Assessment. What can they do? Said, you know, what can they, what can they do? <laughs> yeah, assessment. What can they do? No, we're talking here not about assessing their learning, but, but about their actual learning. We're talking about the, the, the opportunities to learn and what is needed for that learning to take place. Assessment, of course, is a crucial part of learning so that you can get feedback on what you've done, and that, that's, all, that's all included here. And in fact, this next strand includes an element of feedback. It includes an element of assessment because it, it is, drum roll, <laughs> language-focused learning, okay? It, it turns out you can't really learn language without paying attention to the language. Contrary to what some people keep on telling us, you actually have to pay, pay attention to the language itself in order to keep moving forward in your learning. So language-focused learning. So that would include feedback. If, you, if you're trying to say, if you are speaking or writing and you make, you know, you're, not, you're not successful in what you're trying to produce, you need feedback. You need, if you're trying to read something and understand it and you don't understand it properly, you need to be told. You need to have a way of knowing. You need somebody to give you some, I used to call them hooks. You need some, but now, now, it's, now it's more correct to call it scaffolding. But I used to call it hooks. I like hooks, but they're, you know, I got 
overtaken by the scaffold. Um, but scaffolding, you need to provide students with scaffolding so that when they are faced with the language outside of your protected environment, then they have something to work with. They know what to look for. They know what they're trying to get hold of. So language-focused learning is important for those purposes. Oops, and you see I was going to, darn, I was going to ask you to guess what the next one was, but I pressed the button too soon. I will tell you that I've almost never found anybody who guessed the, second, the last one. And it's also probably the least developed aspect of classroom learning because it, what you see here is not, number one, it's not fluency as opposed to accuracy. That's not what it means. Fluency isn't meant to say, oh, he can just talk, 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 but he just makes all those mistakes. That's not what, that's not what I mean by fluency, not what Paul Nation means by fluency here. This means automatized, available, accessible language that you don't have to struggle to produce. It means you've, tr you've said it often enough, and, and most of our language is like that. You, don't, you may not realize it, but most of what you say comes from these packaged pieces that have been in your head over and over again over the thousands of hours that you've been exposed to language. So the more times you get to say something over and over again, but this is still part of meaning-focused learning. This is not pattern practice drill like I used to do in my first years of French language teaching and learning. It's not saying the same decontextualized sentence over and over again. It's using language meaningfully over and over again until it becomes accessible to you automatically. And it's something that I think is, is very little practice. Teachers seem to think they have to go on to the next, you know, they have to go on to the new thing. But in fact, students desperately need to go back over the stuff they've done before. Nothing is learned the first time. There's no such thing as one trial learning. Well, maybe occasionally when you do something really egregious and you get smacked for it. I can tell you some funny stories about how I learned certain phrases in French, but I won't tell you today. Um, but most of the time, you learn something because you've done it over and over. You become fluent and can access something easily because you've done it again and again. So meaning-focused input, meaning-focused output, language-focused learning, and fluency development. And here's the really crazy part. According to Paul Nation, and remember, he's doing most of his work in the context of, of, of vocabulary. He says, you should get equal parts. All four, of you should get equal parts. I'm going to skip because I've just been told. So um, ideal learning conditions would give you the greatest amount of time in the greatest variety of contexts and with the greatest variety of processing times. Because what we also know about language learning is that we are better able to, to retrieve information if we're in situations that are similar to the situations where we learn them. So if we learn everything by pattern practice, retrieving it in a pattern practice kind of way is, is, is going to be OK. But if we learn language in cognitively demanding, age-appropriate, interesting interactions, then in those types of interactions, we'll be better able to retrieve it when the time comes. So I said, Nation suggests that we need to have equal parts of meaning-focused input, meaning-focused output, language-focused learning, and fluency development. You think about that for a few minutes, and you think how hard it is. If you go into a classroom and you do the numbers, um, I made up some numbers, um, but at, at a, I'd say they're probably not too far off. At, I've never, I don't think I've ever been in a classroom where you got less than 50% of the teacher talking, um, and maybe that's meaning focused input. You may hope it is. I mean, I do hope it is. It's not always, but it should be. Um, but getting the other three strands to have to to have their weight in the classroom is a real challenge. But I think just by naming it, just by saying to yourself, "What I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to make sure that students have all those opportunities," then I think that it's a way of making the best use of the time you have. Um, in, my, in my time spent in classrooms, um, of which there's been quite a lot, both as a student and as a teacher, and of course as a researcher, uh, there are certain experiences in the classrooms that make me, that bring me close to tears. I think the one 
that I was uh, discussing the other day with Shim, and when, he, when I told him this, he responded in a way that made me understand that he understood the same thing. I said, it's when I, and I'm in a classroom, and the students are chatting the way you were before we started today, and the teacher says, we're not doing anything until everyone is quiet. <laughs> and, and Shim says, I'm waiting. And that, that kills me. I can't stand to go in a classroom. What I like to see is everybody's talking, and the teacher starts talking to somebody and doing something interesting, and suddenly everybody else wants to know what's going on over there. It, it, to say we're not doing anything until everyone is quiet, certainly in a primary classroom or a secondary classroom, Maybe it works in an adult education situation, I'm not sure, but it surely doesn't work in primary and secondary schools. You, you, no, no. Okay, all right. But on the positive side, one of the things that makes classroom time work is students know what to expect. They know before the teacher says it, how to line up, how to get their books, what, what needs to be done. It's the classroom routines are familiar, this also contributes to routinized fluency development because the same thing, the same things are said and done every day. Then you don't have to think about them; they are they are there as part of language. And silence is not golden in a language classroom. You've got to have people talking. You've got to have people making noise. And you have to use the target language for normal communication, not just for instruction. I think that's the other thing that makes me want to weep in a classroom, is when the teacher is using the students, the language that is being taught, and then when somebody misbehaves, she switches to the native language and you know, punishes or disciplines or, or tells them to, gives them some instruction and you even open the window, close the door, um, things that, that are... Um, the things that are real should be in the language that the students are, are trying to learn. Um, students work together on well-planned activities that have both content and language objectives. So they're working on something, they're working at a level that they can actually handle, not something that's so difficult that they end up necessarily switching to their first language or uh, switching to their first language because they can't get out of a, of a hole. Switching to the first language during uh, a group discussion can be very facilitative and very useful, but then they have to be able to move to the next, they have to be able to achieve the task because it's at the right level for them. And ideally, these tasks have both a content and a language objective. They're not just doing it for the, for the exercise, they're doing it because they have a goal, something that they can achieve. Um, most classrooms need to have uh, need to, to have a bank of activities that students can turn to when everything else that the teacher told them to do has been done, but they still have time and they still have motivation to keep going. Um, in the context of content-based instruction, more and more we're seeing the benefits of having content that's learned in one language reinforced in the other language. But not by repeating it exactly, but by extending it in the other language. Um, and as I said, I can't say often enough, the point of a classroom, of classroom language teaching is to prepare students to keep learning outside the classroom. And finally, in a, in a classroom, I like to see a sense of urgency. I like the teachers and the students to feel, to show that they know that they're working on something important and that they don't have much time to get it done, so they have to really work hard together um, with a sense of urgency. Having said that, I will, I will return to something that I said in conversation with one of you uh, earlier. There also has to be a deep sense of patience and a deep understanding that language learning is hard and it takes a long time. Thank you. Um, one question I've got is with the um, exposure to another language, I am aware of some various cognitive benefits and say delaying onset of dementia. 
Has any research been done with, say, people whose second language may be a dead or a classical language, where they perhaps may not be speaking the language, but they may be very actively engaged with, say, reading texts in that language or analysing it or parsing it? I'm looking around to see, okay, the, okay, the people in the back don't get the question. The question was a very interesting one indeed, and I, I, I won't be able to give an answer to it, but I will, I will open to see if anybody else knows the answer. Um, it, has anyone, we're, we're aware of the research showing cognitive benefits of multilingualism into uh, old age. Has anybody studied the impact of using a dead language, a classical language, a language that isn't really spoken, but that one reads and works out? I mean, my, my, does anybody know of research on that topic? My, my, my intuitive response is that it, if crossword puzzles are good for you, then reading Latin would be good for you. I mean, it, it exercises your cognitive functioning. It, it challenges you. It makes you um, pay attention to detail. It, 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 it forces you to um, analyze and think. Uh, so my, my intuition is that it would have to have cognitive benefits. But whether they, I mean, most of the research on the long-term benefits of bilingualism are with um, spoken languages and languages that people continue to use in their social life, so there's also an element of social benefit that, that keeps people connected with the communities that they are um, coming from. But I would think cognitively, working on a, a, a classical language would, would, have, would certainly have benefit. I, I'll, I'll bet on that. As a kind of a side note, um, I've just recently participated um, in uh, learning another language through a different methodology. Um, it's all to do with the ABLE and A4 study on Alzheimer's. And I'm in the test group because I was rejected for the medical um, benefits of it. Um, but that's another story. And I've um, <laughs> <laughs> exposed to Mandarin symbols. Um, it, it's for somebody's um, master's thesis in any case to see how, whether you can, um, as a learner with uh, Alzheimer's problems or not, being the test group, whether you can actually work out what the symbols could mean when you don't even know what they mean. There's no feedback to it. Mm -hmm. And I found the methodology quite frustrating from where you see what the results are. <laughs> but I think that in this area, probably from um, Alzheimer's studies um, medically, that perhaps they're going to be switching over to language. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Questions or comments? Um, question. I, I just wondered if, if you have an opinion on um, on the notion that um, a lot of schools offer um, students a, a, a progression through through levels, and the assumption is that you would spend 200 hours doing one level, and that would raise you up. 0.5 for band score in an IELTS. Yeah. I wondered if you uh, You know, uh, I, I, I realized that there was an, um, at an early point in my presentation, I was talking about John Car Carroll and his mathematical formula and the amount of uh, time available and the amount of time that's needed for learning. And of course, Carroll's um, definitions of aptitude, which people, you know, people say, oh, he's, he's got a good aptitude, he's really so good at languages, but of course, the, the early versions of aptitude had to do with the speed of learning, not with the ultimate ability to learn. So we know that some people can move through a, a level at, in 200 hours, but for somebody else, it'll take longer. They'll get there, but it will take longer. But the idea that everybody needs exactly the same 200 hours, of course, is not based on any um, research on human learning. It's just, it's, it's an administrative convenience, I think, to be there. Yeah, that's right. I, I just I like the input that you have that it's the reuse because lots of kids who born here and they go to school and always their parents getting letters after letters saying that um, your kid is low in his or her literacy mm -hmm. and these kids born here then I think now I realize that it's the time of use. Yes, they go to school, but when they come to their own home, they speak their own language. So I think time is matters as well. Okay, I'm so glad you said that. 
And that gives us a, I, did anybody in the back here? What does it? Um, the issue of children who were born here, but who speak a different language at home, um, essentially are dividing their time between English and the language they speak at home. And, and as I suggested early in the talk, or probably didn't quite uh, elaborate enough on, one solution to that that a lot of people have proposed is that you should just stop using that other language and put all of your efforts on English. And all of the evidence suggests to the contrary, that what, what you do is you don't say to the child, go home and practice your English. You say to the child, go home and read a story in the language that your mother speaks. Go home and, and talk with your father about something that happened to him today in the language that he speaks. Build up their general language skills. Build up their general world knowledge. Build up their sense of themselves and the families that they grow up in. Um, and be patient for the time that it's going to take to learn English. And that's, I say that, patient, be patient, and try to deal with the administrative realities that limit the amount of time that the students really have available. It, the evidence, I mean, no, most of you will have heard this, that the evidence is that it takes five to seven years for an immigrant child to reach age appropriate levels in the second language. Um, five to seven years is is not an exaggeration. Of course there will be a few exceptions. There will be children who at the end of a year are floating above the crowd and using the language for all sorts of academic purposes, but there will be many others who are struggling and continue to struggle for years and, and, and who are made to feel bad because they think they're supposed to be able to do it in 200 hours or 500 hours or whatever the magic number is. I'll bring a question from my students themselves I teach. Um, adults English and my class is a composite of very highly educated people and those who've had very little education at all mm. in L1 and some of the L1 speakers who haven't been to school said oh we would like a class where it's only those of us who haven't had and all these doctors and the <laughs> biologists and the chemistry people can they please have their own <laughs> class my intuitive feeling was no you're doing really well and I can see you are all making progress I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that, on that streaming of, based on prior education interests and language. I'm sure there are lots of people here who have lots of ideas about that. I, m my intuition is that um, those, there will be differences in the speed of the, of the progress they make, partly because those who are the doctors and the biologists and so forth are going to be equipped to keep using English outside of the classroom in their professional lives. Very likely they will be trying to develop uh, their, their abilities in, in other environments, whereas your students who don't have a, uh, that kind of educational background are trying to create something for themselves in English, and it's going to take them a longer time to get there. Um, but what, what, what I would hope you can do is to um, um, see them help each other, um, see them help each other in their development and to, uh, because the fact that a person doesn't have the, the educational background doesn't mean that they don't have the language learning capacity, it's just that you have to make sure that you target the materials to them in a way that they can manage. So I have a, um, I actually have a comment, so I think I'm loud enough. <laughs> I, have a, I have a comment about the, I also grew up speaking another language as an immigrant family mm -hmm. um, person, and it sort of links from what you're saying to what you're saying, I was the eldest child in the, um, amongst my siblings, and so therefore I was coming home because I went to school first mm -hmm. and coming and speaking English. So by the time my brother went to school, his English was fine, but his Macedonian decreased, yeah. and so, but we helped each other, and so then I was teaching him, he was teaching me, and I think it kind of links back to, I'm interested in your comment on once the le the children helping themselves, and recently I watched this, um, that Sugata Mitra thing about the hole in the wall and getting the students in the Indian slums to teach each other, you know, a language, and they kind of, they start to improve, you know, with the teacher not even being present. Mm -hmm. So that's my comment on that, but I have another question, sorry. I have a question about plateauing, about my students have reached the point, I teach adults, but they're, they're fatigued. Mm -hmm. And I think about, I'm trying to get them to have meaningful input, and oh, I'm trying to give them meaningful input every day, hopefully, and they're trying to give me some meaningful output, but I can see their exhaustion, because I've gone through that with my language learning, 
<laughs> so what do we do with fatigue? Yeah, <laughs> it, it is a, it's a very good question and, and one that every learner and teacher will recognize. Um, and the only answer to it is that there has to be a motivation. There has to be a reason to go to the next level. And yeah. not everybody has that motivation. There'll be reasons, there'll be reasons why people will say, that's it, that's enough for me. And people get to that level at very different points. Some of us are obsessed with getting it right and learning new words and, and getting doing better and better. Um, others of us say, that's okay, I can do my work now, I'm, I'm fine. So if you can, uh, obviously, in the classroom, you can create challenges where they have to do something more in order to succeed in the instructional piece of what's going on in their lives. But beyond the classroom, they may decide that they're where they need to be, and, and they may choose not to go further. Um, I, would, I just want to say something about your Macedonian example. Um, we, we know that um, in, in, in the second language, in, in migrant families, in minority language families, where it is a powerful um, language like English, there's, there is no powerful language like English. There's no other one that's that powerful. But there are, um, there are similar situations in the world where um, eventually the first languages are lost. They will be lost. We just, it's simply, it's just a, a part of human evolution. And it's in some ways tragic, in some ways sad. Um, but the, the point I would make is not to say that, that languages can be saved forever in a family or in a, in a, in a community, but rather that they shouldn't be, um, what is it, untimely um, ripped from their, um, from their environment. They, they, should, they should be allowed, if necessary, to decline, but they shouldn't be quashed. They shouldn't be, it shouldn't be outsiders who decide that you shouldn't speak Macedonian. If you decide, that's your business. But it should not be a school or a, or a, 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 a you know, teacher who says to a child, you should speak English at home to your child. That's shocking. Yeah. It should be up to the family to make that decision. Yeah. Maybe we'll just have one last question. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know a little bit about, you mentioned um, that we should expose students to um, a greater variety of contexts mm -hmm. and a greater variety of processing types. Yeah. But um, also heard you sort of say that, that routines are familiar. Yeah. And, and this seems at times to be like a competing uh, want almost that in mm -hmm. textbooks you either have the, the same approach repeated many times so that sort of idea of familiarity yeah but yeah. at the same time we want to give them different things and get them doing completely different things yeah um, the routine the, the routines that i mentioned are routines of, of organization in the classroom routines that say you know this is what we do at a certain time we we, we, we do our we, you, 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 don't, you shouldn't have to explain to everybody how to uh, prepare their exercise sheet or something. Every, everything everything that's, that's, that's potentially routinized, just get it out of the way so that you don't have to spend time on that. But then in the instructional uh, elements of a, of a, a class, you, the greatest possible variety of, especially of processing types, more, lots of listening, lots of speaking, um, listening to things that are on, the, on, a, on a, a digital recording, listening to each other in a conversation. Uh, not, not always the teacher talking, and not always uh, doing the same kinds of exercises. Um, I mentioned this the other day, but then I've realized that I often mention the same thing several times, so those of you who were there at the other talk, um, when John Fanslow uh, was one of my teachers at uh, Teachers College Columbia back in the long time ago, one of the things that he told me, uh, he observed in his research, was that when teachers start out a year, they have a great variety of activities. And over time, they use fewer and fewer and fewer activities. And on the one hand, you might say, oh, that's because they figured out what really worked. <laughs> but on the other hand, it might be because they just decided, oh, it's too much hard, too much effort to do all that preparation of different things. But that, it, that that's the idea, that if you don't want to sink into um, the same thing over and over again. In order to keep the brain moving and keep the development happening, then a greater variety of activity types. Um, Benslow was funny. He used to say, um, well, you had, last week you had them underline all the words they didn't know. This week they did underline all the words they do know. Um, but he would say, okay, well, this week you taught standing in front of the class. 
Next week, stand on top of the desk. But anything to keep the attention and keep the activity, keep, them, keep things happening. Uh, that was, I mean, he was only half joking. I think he, in fact, would stand on top of the desk. Yeah. Uh, well, we might leave it there and have discussion um, afterwards. Um, I'd like to thank Patsy. I guess I've taken away several hooks as a learner, <laughs> as a teacher, and as a researcher. I, that notion of preparing students for learning outside the classroom, I think is so important. And as a learner, I've tried to learn a language several times, and now I guess I have this mental block that I can't find the time to learn a language. <laughs> so I'm a bit, feeling a bit reassured that maybe I fit into that category of older learner, and I can use explicit and intentional strategies to learn a language. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of La Trobe and Big TESOL, and also, um, I'd like to thank Latrobe for providing Victisa with this opportunity to co-host this presentation tonight. And I'd like to hook you on to Victisa <laughs> and um, say that we are your um, professional association. We provide um, professional learning throughout the year, and there is um, some sheets of paper, large sheets of paper with post-it stickers. So we'd like you to. Let us know what professional learning you would like um, next year, whether it's in the early childhood schools or adult sector. Um, also, we do a lot of advocacy in the area, along with the Australian Council of TESOL Associations, our national body. Um, we'd like to let you know about TESOL in Context, which is the Australian journal for TESOL and that we um, encourage you to um, contribute to the journal, whether you'd like to um, read the journal or whether you would like to contribute articles to the journal. And next year, um, we hope to um, produce a special issue of TESOL in Context, which has the theme of ethics in TESOL education. And also the Australian Council of TESOL Association National Conference is on in Adelaide in October next year and um, there's a call for papers currently for that conference. And I guess the other hook I thought is Paul Nation's Four Strands and maybe that's something that we could think about in terms of the Big TESOL Symposium which we host every year, whether we could use mm -hmm. those strands for our strands mm -hmm. for the symposium. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. much and thank you all for your good questions and for your attention. Uh, I, I could see that my um, yes. <laughs> so I what think could it, be in there? Oh, I think it might be a bit of Australian um, something or other. So thank you very much. A lot of food for thought. So thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Thank you.